Welcome to the Loadout Music Podcast, featuring intimate conversations with emerging and established musicians, recorded at the Gaslight Studios in St. Louis. And now your host, Aaron Perlin. Welcome back to the Loadout Music Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Perlitt, and we are presented by Shinesty and Wellbeing Brewing. You know, for the last year and a half or so, since I heard our next guest on SiriusXM's Outlaw Country, I have been trying to get him on this show because he has a remarkable story of what I believe to be just resilience. And uh, fortunately, we were able to finally get Waylon Payne on the loadout. And Waylon, I am, um, I'm thrilled to have you on here today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thrilled to be here as well. Thank you. You know, I mentioned in the lead in that, that your story is one of resilience and, um, you know, because of of a lot of choices you've made in your life and addiction and some issues, you've kind of fallen off the radar, I think for radar for someone with your level of talent, which is pretty immense. Um, But I'd love to kind of take a step back and just talk about you and where you come from and introduce you to our audience. Cause you know, uh, obviously, and I'm sure everyone that interviews you talks about this, you have pretty famous parents. (laughs) Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, your, you know, your father played with Willie Nelson for years and years, and your mother was a um, was an incredibly respected country singer. Uh, yeah. But you really didn't grow up with them. Well, no, I, I didn't meet my father till I was about sixteen years old. Um, until then, I grew up with my uh, mother's family uh, down in South Texas, my aunt and uncle, and. Um, um, Pretty much, they raised me down there. I would I would spend a, you know, a year here or a year there with mom, and most summers, I, or most every summer, I was with her, uh, doing uh, whatever we did in the summertime. And where was she? Where was she? Was she in Nashville? Was she touring? She was based out of Nashville for quite a while until I was in about the fourth grade, and then we migrated back to our home state of Oklahoma, if you will. Uh, mm-hmm. That's her. That's her home state, and we've lived off and on and. We've bounced back and forth between Oklahoma and Texas my whole life, you know. It, they, yeah. It's like it's like they're it's like it's almost one state to me in a way, uh, you know, because uh, they're so closely associated with home. Did you feel um, because you were left to be raised by your aunt and uncle, and it was a, I think ultimately, and we'll get to this, a very different environment than I think would have been ideal for you. Did you feel? a sense of loss, a sense of emptiness, because, you know, no, you feel- no, not at all. My, uh, they were very, very, you know, they were very decent folks. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, they were hard. They were a strict and, uh, Southern Baptist. Uh, but you know, they took an extra mouth in to feed, uh, when they didn't have to in the seventies. So, um, I'm extremely grateful that, uh, you know, and I, and I called them mom and dad, you know what I mean? It wasn't like it was any, you know what I mean? We had a, weird, we had a very, very strange, but, uh, uh, I was knowledgeable of everyone that was in our family. If that makes sense. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But as you get older and you get into your teens, your life begins to change. And from what I've read and heard in different interviews, you experienced abuse growing up. Yeah. Um, um, you know, and it's something that, you know, okay, it's, first of all, I don't hear, I don't hear many young men or older men even talking about this stuff, but for yeah. some reason it just felt necessary to get that out in the, in the open more. Yeah. It, you know what I mean? Uh, there was sex abuse in my life from, you know, from a trusted family member and it just, it destroyed the family. And, uh, when I talked about it, it just kind of, it just, uh, just kind of swept under the rug and and I was thrown over here for being gay and called a liar. You know what I mean? So it was something, first of all, that is never a situation anybody is ever ready to walk through. It comes out of nowhere. It carries a lot of shame carries a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of crazy thoughts with it and uh lasting thoughts that last you know way up into your golden years 
And so, um, looking back as I got sober, you know, I had a really good friend, I had a really good friend coming into my life. His name's Edward. And Edward is a different kind of a fella, you know? I mean, uh, he, uh, uh, Texan, um, and I had just, for some reason, somewhere along the way, I had gotten really way off track because I'd never dealt with that stuff. I never dealt with uh, any of that. It just was like a next phase. All of a sudden, I was somewhere by myself doing something else. You know what I mean? And it was, uh, it seemed every little bit there was something that would help me ease the pain, you know, whether it was my cigarettes or uh, sneaking into bars when I was underage because I was handsome and they'd let me, you know, I mean, uh, just a, a flat out did not respect my body. I bedded down with everything. I was a prostitute for a while. I was, you know what I mean? I, I went through so many uh, phases in my life because of that situation. And it only took, you know, 20 years or I don't know how many it took, you know, I, I, uh, I just never dealt with it and it kept getting worse and worse and worse, you know, you know? and uh, I mean, it, it just one day you just bam, the bottom falls off from under you and you didn't really understand where it all went wrong. But then once you start going to some counseling and stuff, yeah. put things in their places where they belong, not stuck in a trunk somewhere, then it gets, you know, it, it, it gives you tools. You find yeah. tools in those toolboxes when you open them. <laughs> Uh, dang, I sound like Oprah Winfrey right now. <laughs> and uh, that experience caused a an enormous chasm between you and your mother for a period of time, correct? Because when you well, start yeah, talking I mean, about the sexual like abuse. I said, it destroyed the family for a, a number of years. You know, it was just something that nobody's ever ready to deal with that. You know, uh, and and for a, a you know for the rest of my life, my life had changed. I was disowned and my mom and I didn't talk for a number of years. Uh, but my dad and I started hanging out a lot more frequently than my, my late teens, early twenties. Uh, I would just hop on the bus with him and Willie Nelson's band. And it was, uh, it was a real education in, uh, in music. And, and if you watch closely, you can learn so much. And I learned so much from Willie Nelson on those times. You know, he didn't really care. He, everybody knew what had gone on uh, because I think, you know, daddy was part of the family. The family, you know, are all for one and one for all. And uh, so everybody knew what had gone on and just kind of, it was just like, hey, fuck them, you know. Yeah. No, you, you come home here with us and, and we treat everybody with respect. Now, it did lead to me and daddy learning how to party. <laughs> well, and you've talked about that a lot, that your father was the one who introduced you to drugs, which yeah. sent you down, you know, a rabbit hole throughout many well, years. Well, I mean, like, let, you know, and, and like I give, it's not all him. You know, I have to, yeah. uh, I have to also embrace the fact that I was a 19, 20, 21 year old kid who was partying with the one of the greatest bands in freaking music history and my daddy was the lead player and like i was just doing what my daddy did I was just watching my dad might not have wanted to watch him more so then i would have started paying attention to willie maybe if i'd have paid more attention to willie it would have you know but like our relationship my dad and i just our relationship was based on music and and doing anything but talking about personal stuff was it nice for you to find that connection with your father any connection especially after you had not met him until you were 16 yeah well i mean we didn't start off so good you know and yeah. and we we uh had our experiences especially toward the end of his life he he did things the way he wanted to do then and that's good he lived a long happy life uh but it was just it was kind of cool that you know i mean I, I i was afforded the ability to go live like a rock star anytime i wanted to all i have to do was just step on that bus of hippies and and when i had gotten thrown out that was the end of my religious career i was in oklahoma baptist university going to yeah. college they expelled me so i mean i i didn't really get god anymore for a while so i put being a preacher out of my mind and went for my first true love which was country music and so you, you in country music 
they don't talk a lot about sexuality, uh, especially. Well, I mean, no. <laughs> well, they talk about sexuality in, in, in terms of men and women, but they certainly don't talk about being gay a lot. And it, it's almost, um, you know, uh, blasphemy to a degree. How, 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 you know, I talked earlier again, resilience. The, to me, this is one of the many, the many shades of resilience that you have demonstrated in your career uh, in your lifetime in that you've been able to kind of move against the grain, but how challenging was that, especially, you know, being with this remarkably historic country band on the road um, and you're a young gay kid trying to fit in and, you know, you're living the rock and roll lifestyle, but something inside of you, I would imagine is just like, I don't fit in part of this world. No, never. I mean, because when I, when I was, cast away from my family uh i made the decision then and there that i was never going to be disrespected again i've never had a problem with it yeah. the only people that i had a problem with were the family for a while and when that happened i changed my life and i decided i'm not hanging out with anybody or letting anybody close to me that doesn't respect me for me and i've never there was never a big coming out thing it's like i mean you know if you knew me you knew you know yeah. that was just that was that was my life it, it was like okay well let's you know whatever uh who cares what you're into? Let's talk about what what's real. You know, <clears throat> it's never been a, it's never been a thing. Now, a lot of people will probably tell you um, that I probably would be a lot farther along in my career. Maybe had I not uh, been so vocal about being me. Yeah. Uh, and <clears throat> that's okay. As Billy Joe Shaver told me one time, he was like, you're in it, son. You're in it. You don't have to be in any hurry to go anywhere. You're, you made it. You're here. Just figure out what you're supposed to do next. The great Billy Joe Shaver. What's it like um, being royalty? I mean, that's like it's that's like tongue being... in cheek, and that's <laughs> tongue in cheek. But uh, I will say, I will say this: I believe in that. I, I, yeah. I, I've called myself that for a long time, and I do it with pride because my mother was a queen. Yeah, you know, uh, my mother and my father helped shape music today in each each in their own way and uh yeah my mama was a queen so uh that makes me a prince <laughs> and i carry it very very yeah. boldly and and very proudly because i used to uh i used to cause a lot of ruckus wherever i went uh it seemed like it just followed me and uh <clears throat> i'm very proud to be I mean, thank God I'm not on country radio <laughs> in a way <clears throat> because for A, I couldn't get on there anyway. And who cares? Uh, maybe people will take me even more serious now. Uh, but uh, I go everywhere and I try to make my mama proud and, and her friends proud that raised me. And that's, I, I do it for Sammy Smith. I do it for Chris Christopherson. I do it for Willie Nelson. I do it for Bobby Gentry. I do it for all the greats that came before me that loved me enough to give me something along the way. And so, uh, you know, we'll take this thing as far as it goes. I don't think I'm going anywhere. I hope not knock on wood. Um, and I've moved to Texas recently, so it's got, it's given me even more of a chance to slow down. And, um, I had forgotten the beauty of having one's own thoughts and writing them down you know, and, and doing your own thing again. So it's kind of neat. It's just kind of neat uh, to see how things have, have sorted themselves out. You know, once I got sober and started putting stuff away where it belonged, like in the proper, you know, not deep down, <laughs> but like up on the shelf, you know, so yeah. you could look at it and remember it with, or try to make peace with it. Uh, I don't know. Life's pretty sweet. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's, it, it has not been an easy road for you. Uh, yeah. So, you know, let's get more into music. So in 2004, uh, you finally, after some trials and tribulations and trying to get some people to pay attention when you were in LA, uh, you I get, got some help from, from Pat Green and Willie Nelson. Ultimately, you were signed to a label and you released The Drifter, your first record, which is a really good record. <laughs> it, Thank you. Um, it's a really terrific record. You've got some of your own stuff in there. You've got 
um, some pieces you did uh, that were written by some friends of yours, like Shelby Lynn. Um, yes. Uh, but you do this record and it's well received, you know, for a, call it a freshman, whatever you, you know, you want to use to, to describe it. But um, then you disappear. It's like, um, it reminded, <laughs> it reminded me of um, somewhere between Neil Diamond's version of the jazz singer and, um, and Eddie and the cruisers where they both just kind of disappear for a while and then reemerge. But your mother, after you released the album, you had, by that point, you had reconnected with your mother. You would become close again. And, yeah. and she, she passed away not long after you released the record, correct? Just a few months after, yeah. And I had developed quite a, I had developed quite a meth problem. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? I'd like, I, I had learned how to party with my dad. And, and like, so it, when you're out on a rock and roll bus or a country bus, especially from the 70s and the 80s, it was just different. Yeah. A lot of drinking, a lot of drugs, not, you know, we did, we weren't on Willie's bus, so I can't say that, but I did, you know, there was a lot of weed, uh, but there was other stuff that was around. And I had been part, I was a young kid, dude, you know, I mean, like, yeah. uh, everybody thinks they're bulletproof when they're young. And so I partied, I had a good time, but then all of a sudden I got into a situation really kind of that I, I was not equipped to handle. I got involved with somebody who, uh, was in a really low place in his life and uh, he had uh, a really bad habit of smoking meth and that was just a different experience for me and before I knew it I was I was hooked and and uh, it started it started wreaking its havoc and uh, when my mom died that threw me over the edge and like uh, I was I was hell-bent to get to wherever she was you know yeah so were you even able to when you first put out the record were you in a condition where you could even tour to support the record at the time? I mean, I was doing pretty good. You know what I mean? I did a lot of work during those, those years. Uh, yeah. and, and I was a brand new user that way. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've been used to going off and partying with my dad for days and then having to pull myself together and go do business or go do back to work yeah, or whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? There was a difference between this though, because all of a sudden, I mean, I had got out there and I'd gotten every dream I wanted. Uh, you know, great big, huge record deal. I was driving a classic Cadillac. I was living in a, a freaking beautiful apartment that, you know, belonged to Judy Garland. And I mean, you know, it was like it was. I was living a fairy tale out there, and like, but uh, I was watching it all go away because I got really strung out on on meth. You know, yeah. and uh, it took years for me to realize what what was going on there. Everybody else around me could see it. You know, <laughs> yeah. not me though. Nope, I'm just I'm I'm fine. I would just lock myself away and. Before I knew it, I had a huge problem and yeah. moved back to Nashville and moved to Needles. And uh, it was just a, it was a rough, it was a rough go. And, you know, a, as a gay man living in Judy Garland's apartment, that's pretty much the epitome that you've, you've reached the, the, the top of the mountain. It's, it's done, you know, you, that's it right there. Right? <laughs> and believe it or not, it really, it really never, I mean, I, I can tell you some stories and I will <laughs> sometime if we ever meet for a drink. Um, I, you know, I don't know if it was the drugs. I don't know if it was Hollywood, but I started, I started, started being able to see things that I don't think were meant to be seen. Yeah. Uh, I saw her ghost many times. Uh, uh, so I don't know if I was in a place where I was going so fast that I caught up with them <laughs> on the next realm or, or what, but, uh, you know, it was, a it was definitely an experience. But, uh, I, I'm, but I mean, but being a gay man didn't really, I just can't, ex I guess maybe I just can't explain it enough. Like once that was put away where it went, you know, it was never really, it, just it, not it, a thing. Not even, it, was, it was nothing that ruled my life. It never kept me from getting a job. It never kept me from, uh, having a happy life. If I wanted one, I got plenty of sex. You know what I mean? I was pretty, whatever, you know, it was never, it was just, it was just who I was in California afforded me that ability i'm gonna i'm gonna tell you that i mean i was raised in texas and oklahoma and i'd never been anywhere where you had just a brand new clean slate nobody knew who you were and when you move out there 
fresh after dealing with something like that, you know, within four or five years, that's still pretty traumatic, you know? And uh, you never have dealt with it. You just go, uh, you know, being out in California, there were lots of like-minded people fell into a group of actors and singers and songwriters that we just, we just really, uh, it, it, it was like nobody cared, you know, there weren't rules because we made up our own and we, we kept having these successes that were just really badass and we did it on our own. You know, me and Keith Gaddis made that record for borrowed money and I went to New York and I got a record deal walking into damn Universal Records by myself. A kid from freaking Texas and Tennessee and Oklahoma. And so, you know, it was really easy to birth that guy way than pain out there, you know, yeah. and, and we partied because that's what we saw our heroes do until we all clued in that, that, you know, you really had to stop that if you wanted to get work done, you know, yeah. and all of us did. Now we're all still very, very successful at what we do. You know, we just don't party that much anymore. <laughs> at least I don't. <laughs> we are speaking with Waylon Payne and we'll be right back after this message. Hey, this is Aaron Perlett, and for those who have been listening, know that Wellbeing Brewing is pretty much my favorite drink in the world because I quit drinking alcohol a couple of years ago and discovered Wellbeing, and it really has been my salvation. I am fortunate to be joined by Jeff Stevens, who is the founder and CEO of Wellbeing. Jeff, first of all, thank you so much for being a partner with The Loadout, and tell us about, this is such a unique non-alcoholic beer because it actually tastes like great beer yeah I, well thank you for saying that because that's the most important thing for us uh, we invested a lot of money into figuring out how to make great non-alcoholic craft beer and that was something that i was really interested in and to have someone like you say you know what i can drink this beer and do all the things that i would normally do and don't miss a thing that just that makes it all you know so great for us and it is a craft beer i mean you know i was a, a from the time I was probably 14 or 15, I was a drinker until I was the time I was about 47. Yeah. And I have always been a beer guy, beer and bourbon. And, um, and I especially got into more flavorful beers over the past 10 years, but well-being, whether it's the Hellraiser Amber or the well-being and you've actually got, or, or the IPA rather, and you've got a pretty nice group of growing products, yeah. um, that, uh, that are pretty impressive, but I, What's the secret to, I mean, uh, you, you know, when you compare it to some of the other more watered down mm -hmm. imitators, what's the secret to making it so good? Yeah, there's several ways you can make non-alcoholic beer, and we chose this way called vacuum distillation. So what it allows us to do, and this is the thing that comes through, is we fully ferment the beer. We make it just like you'd normally make alcohol beer. So it's ready to be alcohol beer, and then we... Uh, take it, put it in a vacuum, lower the boiling point of the beer, and t and gently remove the alcohol. So what it what you're left with is all the mouthfeel and the flavor of beer without the alcohol. And I think that's what where our products are distinct is that mouthfeel, that aroma, that flavor that really comes through. Versus uh, you can stop the fermentation. You know that's another method. And and those are are, are a little more watery. I think or just don't quite hold up as well. If that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for being a, a partner. If you want to sample well-being, you can go to wellbeingbrewing.com yep. and use the code LOADOUT10. LOADOUT10. LOADOUT10 at checkout, and you will get a discount on well-being from being a, a, a LOADOUT listener. Jeff, thank you so much for being a partner, and thank you so much for making this amazing product. Aaron, my pleasure. Thank you for drinking it. And we're back with Waylon Payne on the Loadout Music Podcast. Waylon, right before the break, we were talking about when your record came out in 2004 and your mother passed away. And by that point, your drug addiction was kind of getting to uh, really full force at that point. And it would be 16 years until you recorded another album under for yourself. I mean, in the meantime, yeah. you... I mean, you wrote, you've written music for Leanne Womack and Miranda Lambert, uh, for Charlie Robeson, um, and some other folks. You also have had a, a pretty prolific acting career uh, in the vein of Dwight Yoakam. That you've had great success in in music and on the on, on the screen. But uh, a lot of people might not know that you were in uh, Walk the Line. You played Jerry Lee Lewis uh, alongside Joaquin Phoenix in uh, in Walk the Line. That must have been a uh, a fun experience. Great honor. What a great, what a great experience was that. Uh, who doesn't want to go to Hollywood and become a movie star? 
I mean, like, right, like, look at, I mean, like, seriously, I went to Hollywood and I got everything I ever, if I, if I dreamed it, it would happen. And like, yeah. I mean, I, it was like, uh, it was like the golden ticket, you know, and um, it was beautiful. I had such a good time in that film. And uh, that was early on in my drug problem. So I was able to, you know, put things down and go to work and then pick back up where I left off when I got done. And, you know, but what a great experience that was. Yeah. And you got to be in, you know, a number of, of features and television shows. You've been on CSI. Uh, you played uh, Hank Garland in Crazy in 2007. Um, at, at what point, though, do you kind of hit rock bottom? What's what was the point where you're like, holy shit, I'm I'm fucked. 2008. I, uh, okay. I, I had been in Nashville for a while and I spent all my money and uh, went through, uh, I got arrested for some weed and then I went through a sexual assault and I couldn't go to the police and because I'd gone to buy meth and it was just a, it was just a crazy, 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 crazy time. No power, no water in the house, you know, and uh, I had booked some gigs with my friend Corey Morrow down in Texas and, um, and it was all like angels did it. I really was like at the last minute, this, this buddy of mine, Chris showed up and he's, I mean, he's just literally like appeared at the door. He's like, Hey man, you got a gig in two days in Texas. We got to go. And so I literally grabbed some guitars and the clothes on my back and I've left everything. <laughs> and I never went back to that house in Nashville. I made my way to Texas. Um, met my buddy Edward. And for some reason I just trusted him like no other. And, uh, he became almost almost like a almost like a surrogate father figure, best friend, hero kind of person. And slowly but surely, man, he saw that I was in in bad shape. I moved on to Willie's Ranch and uh, rented a little condo there for a while and started working on getting sober. And, and it took a couple of years, but uh, you know, uh, finally, uh, my fortieth birthday. Uh, which was uh, April the 5th, uh, 2000, what, 12? Uh, that was the last day I did meth, you know. Edward had a baby, and that baby moved something in me because he was special, and he he knew me, and I knew him, and my friend loved me. My friends loved me. And uh, I put it down and then I started going to counseling and uh, I started talking about things that, I, that had happened. I uh, thought my music had died, but uh, slowly, as soon as I got sober and even a little bit before I started writing this record and, uh, you know, this record's been coming for about 10 years. Uh, some of the songs, you know, they just, they just happened through this experience and, you know, Sins of the Father is about my buddy Edward and Lake. Uh, Santa Anna wins. I was living in Hollywood right before his first birthday, Lake's first birthday, and it was a lullaby to him, uh, birthday song, and I got to go home and see him. That You know what I mean? And uh, Dangerous Criminal. It's just all a shiver. You know, shiver I'd written in 2004 at the end of that relationship that I let myself get into that had destroyed me. And uh, that was the end of that, you know what I mean? So it kind of felt like, it just felt like everything should be, it's, it's kind of like what happened over the past 16 years, you know? And I let myself feel it. And uh, when I started writing songs about it, I, I felt like I owed it to myself to really let people know what had gone on because I don't hear people talk about that. And, uh, so I just started writing essays, yeah. one for each song, and, and uh, it was real therapeutic, you know. Now is is and of course we're talking about the the record "Blue Eyes, the Harlot, the Queer, the Pusher, and Me." Um, is "Back from the Grave" uh, the most autobiographical song? Is it about you finding your way back from this remarkably low point in two thousand eight? Every single song on the album is about me finding my way back from yeah. that place. Uh, back from the grave happened, you know, around 2015. I felt like I had my shit together long enough 
And uh, so I made the decision to move back to Nashville to try to salvage, you know, try to figure out what was going on. And I went to my buddy Frank Liddell's office and he had been my publisher years before. And one of my oldest friends in Nashville and uh, he gave me my job back. I owed him some songs, so I made up my debt and kept writing. And he heard the record when I first got back in its in its roots inception. And um, then he proceeded to help me get it to where the rest of the world would be able to hear it the way we heard it. And it was really and, uh, beautiful. We uh, we recorded it at uh, the old Monument Studio, which is Zach Brown's uh, uh, studio over off Music Row. Uh, and, and, uh, it was the same spot my mom stood in when she sang, help me make it through the night. I, I sat in the same spot and I sang the whole record and, uh, recorded it. And it was, it was really neat. And of course, pretty much anyone who's heard that record, um, has seen it as just a remarkable piece of music, a collection of music, rather a remarkable piece of art. It's, um, I mean, it's really taken you to a different level. I like to think so. I, I just, you know what I mean? I, I like the message that uh, it's mine. It's my story. Yeah. It's, uh, those are my true, actual life events. Every single one of them. And uh, uh, I look at it as a, as a celebration maybe of, of uh, perseverance and uh, never giving up, you know. Uh, once you figure out that you are worth something and that you you have a great ability inside of yourself to love yourself, once that happens, uh, man, the doors that start open when you just treat yourself with all the respect and kindness and love that you can, you know, uh, it it's. Uh, Something that I live my life by is I try to be a good guy. I try not to be an asshole. And I try really hard uh, to live right now because you can't, as Willie Nelson told me, name dropper, uh, you can't do anything about yesterday. You can't do anything about tomorrow. The only thing you can control, if you can control anything, is right now. And as long as you've got right now in check, everything else is a piece of cake. That's the message I hope you get from this record. <laughs> We're talking to the great Waylon Payne. We'll be right back after these messages. And now a quick word from one of our sponsors. Have you ever wanted a tightly wrapped American flag around your waist with a giant bald eagle face placed squarely on your junk? Or how about a Steve Harvey coronavirus mask? Or maybe the next evolution of jorts in the form of a hot and sexy denim Speedo. But maybe, just maybe, you're dying for a pair of Kansas City Chiefs overalls or even leopard pants. Yes, 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 and most definitely, yes. And it's all pretty easily found at Shinesty, the perfectly weird party gear website that I find myself escaping to every time I need a mental break from the miserable 2020 we've been having. So check out our new sponsor at Shinesty.com. That's the word shine sty.com and use the code loadout15 that's loadout15 at checkout now back to this less than spectacular show and we're back on the loadout music podcast with Waylon Payne and we were talking about his most recent record Blue Eyes the Harlot the Queer the Pusher and Me um, I think it's pretty obvious but talk about just the title because it's a remarkably long title but uh, it's funny because when I think about it, I think to myself, I think he's perhaps all of those people. And Could be. Uh, it, maybe that's what it turned out to be. Uh, look, I used to have, uh, I used to love getting high with needles. Yeah. And uh, I could not, I could not uh, administer to myself. And my buddy Tyler, who was my dope dealer at the time, would, would always take me for my ride. And uh, we lived in this rundown place over in, or he did. We spent a lot of time there. We called it Mexico. And then we went uh, to the lake and there was a houseboat there. We called it the Gulf of Mexico. So 
um, it, it was really my, we would hang out and just do what high people do, junkies do, I guess, just get high and go. And uh, inevitably, he would always pull out the guitar and he would sing The Silver Tongued Devil and I by Chris Christopherson. He was fascinated with that song. We were all fascinated with Chris because he's just God to us, you know. And, to, a lot, uh, to a lot of people he is. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Tyler was like, man, you should come up with something as creative as that one day. And I literally just opened my mouth and said, old blue eyes, the harlot, the queer, the pusher, and me. And he made me write it down. And he made me promise that I would name a record that one day. And I almost didn't follow through with that promise. Uh, in the end, Frank Liddell and Eric Massey, the producers, reminded me of those words and reminded me that they were mine. And, and it seemed apt to keep that promise. Yeah. So I'm guessing, based on past tenure, we're going to get a new record from you in 2036. Is that right? Now nah, stop it. <laughs> Actually, you're, uh, you're going to hear new music, I believe, on October uh, well, I tell you what, September 11th is the one year anniversary of Blue Eyes, The Harlot, The Queer, The Pusher, and Me. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, we're announcing that there's uh, some new music coming shortly thereafter. It's um, called The Lost Act, and it features some songs that we recorded that weren't intended to go on here, but we decided to polish them up and put them on there. So new music will be coming within the next couple of months. I would imagine new album, new album, maybe next year. I, I would imagine. Well, and today the way that that artists are dropping singles, EPs versus full albums, it's a completely different game than say, I mean, when you, when you came back and released a record 16 years later, you must've been like, well, shit, this is not the same uh, industry that I was in 16 years ago. I mean, it's, Oh, well, I'm very well aware it is not the same industry, but uh, I'm serious one more time. I got a dream come true. I've always, I mean, since I was four years old, uh, you know, I loved, I had a love for vinyl records because my mom made vinyl records. And I don't know if you can explain that any deeper than you just have to be four years old and associate that record with your mama and that you don't get to see very often but you can hear her anytime you want and it's a fascinating fascinating thing all i ever wanted was my own album and uh not only to get that holdable in my hand and able to drop down on my turntable which has been a part of my life since birth uh and to record it at the same place that my mother recorded every single hit song she ever had with me in her stomach at times is really, really a beautiful thing. And like, I am still such a country dumbass. I believe this thing will probably hit the top of the charts soon. It's just, it's just on its way up. <laughs> <laughs> but you made, I mean, you made an interesting point earlier and I, we, we, I've had a number of guests, most of the guests on this, on this show that are in the, we'll call it the, the alt country space whether you want to call it Americana or what have you. Um, most recently, uh, Paul Thorne and BJ Barham from American uh, Hey, listen, listen, Paul Thorne, that is some freaking bad A man music. I think he's the greatest thing in the world. I've got he's, all his records uh, in my phone. He's pretty remarkable. And I drive across the country in my Lincoln a lot. That's how I get to my gigs. I'm, I'm a self-traveler and... Uh, I have been having the best time, especially this past year, getting to know Paul Thorne's music because he's, I met him at an airport one afternoon, just a delightful gentleman. Uh, and I love listening to him talk and tell stories and BJ as well. BJ is a, he's, he's a hoss. So they're both pretty badass, but you definitely don't want to take a punch from Paul since he uh, has been in the ring with uh, Roberto Duran, but uh, no, no, Paul reminds me, I'd want uh, him on my side, though. <laughs> yes, I would. Uh, and he's an they're both intense guys. Very, very intense about what they do, about their life. Um, Paul, his m musically reminds me to a degree, to a degree, and I think you'll appreciate this with your Texas roots, of Lyle Lovett. There's, because he's got that a sense of gospel, country, Americana, um, and it's just that Lyle probably has a little more fun with it 
uh, but Paul's music actually is, can be very fun and self-deprecating and extremely interesting, especially some of his commentary on the church. Oh, I just love him. I mean, I think we would be really good friends because he says he was raised by uh, pimps and preachers and uh, hello, I, you know, <laughs> I'm serious. We like, we, that's maybe why it hits so close to home because I've lived that life too. Uh, so yeah. yeah. That episode will be coming out uh, very shortly. The next episode will be dropping and uh, yeah, he, his father was a, uh, was a, was a Baptist preacher and his uncle was a pimp and uh, that's what that record is all about. But uh, yeah, interesting guy, great, great music. Um, but my point earlier was that it, it's, it fascinates me still to this day that some of the best music being made today can only be heard essentially on serious outlaw country, <laughs> not to make a commercial for them, but it's, I mean, some, hey, man, it's like, it's like, to me, it's like a, it's no different than it was. Look at, I used to pray that I would be able to live the life my mama lived Well, I'm in it. I mean, she had a million seller and never saw a dime from it. Yeah. We have music all over the airwaves. We're never going to see a dime for it, but you know what? It's like AM radio. Maybe something will hit soon. Because there's but, still there's still there's still a shot, you know. But when, but when your mom was playing though, she was being heard alongside of your godfather Waylon Jennings, your dad's music on traditional country radio. Today, there's not a chance in hell that your music is going to end up on traditional country radio, along with no. along with some of it. Like Jason Isbell, considered one of the best songwriters of the last 15 years, you will not hear his music on radio. Um, no. And the only well, place- I'm used to not being played on the radio. They never <laughs> played the first one either. So, uh, as a matter of fact, though, I'm I'm just absolutely tickled to death with Sirius XM because uh, more people show up at my shows that know my music, which is a trip that's never happened to me before. I'll yeah. take what I can get. I'm okay with it. Uh, I'm I'm here for many years. I hope so. Uh, you know, now that I got my head on straight, I'm and maybe it's time to pay some dues that I thought I'd paid along the way and didn't. You know. I, I remember speaking with the guest uh, Sam Morrow is out of LA. He's, a, he's actually from Houston, a terrific artist too. Another one of these guys just kind of flies under the radar. But he uh, he and I were texting I don't know, two months ago. He's like, yeah, I can't wait to go play for two people in Nebraska in some bar. Uh, you know, this guy's got a record deal who makes, you know, beautiful, beautiful music kind of, you know, in the vein of somewhere between like Little Feet, uh, if you're a fan of Little Feet. Oh, I love him. And uh, he's... You know, that, that's the reality of being on the road. You, I think, have some good fortune right now, and you happen to be touring with uh, someone who's got their own radio show that can do a pretty good job of promoting it and who's easy on the eyes. So it's... Uh... <laughs> and such a sweetheart. I've been touring with Elizabeth Cook this past uh, uh, month or so, and we're about to pick it up again next month and in October. Uh, and uh, it's... Uh, it's uh, it's been a trip. She's great. That music is real. That music is, uh, is, uh, is country. That's so we're all country singers. They just call us different stuff now. <laughs> well, you know, I don't mind being on Sirius XM with those guys. Uh, cause those, those cats are the real deal. You know, my music's getting played right behind beside those icons as well. You know? Yeah. You know, you're, you're uh, we were talking about country radio and what's being played and what's not, um, and you were, you were saying how, you know, you are fortunate to be, uh, being played with just some terrific artists, uh, today, uh, on Sirius XM's Outlaw Country, which, uh, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's just, it's a remarkable amount of, of, of really great music being made today. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, you hear so many different kinds, you know, you see, you hear so many different, it's just, it's just, there's, a, there's a damn pandora's box out there you know what i mean just open that thing up and just let it flow and there's some we're living in a really cool time because a lot of different people are getting a lot of different chances you know and uh and the good thing about serious is is like you know they'll latch on to something good and they'll play it and uh thank god they do you know thank god they do yeah yeah well, Waylon Payne, it has been an absolute honor and pleasure having you on the Loadout Music Podcast. Um, we are thrilled to hear you've got some new music coming out in October, and we'll look for that uh, look for that announcement coming up here soon. You'll be on the road with Elizabeth Cook all over the country, um, and uh, unfortunately not coming through St. Louis. And hopefully, 
you will bust Elizabeth's chops about coming on this show because I can't get any response out of her people. So and she needs to get well, on. Well, you uh, keep trying. I'm sure they'll get you. <laughs> Waylon Payne, thank you so much for being on the loadout. Thank you, Aaron. Hey, folks, if you made it this far and judging by our numbers, you haven't. Thanks for listening to the Loadout Music Podcast. You can always find us at loadoutmusic.com and wherever you like to get your podcasts like iTunes or SoundCloud. And of course, as always, thanks to Gaslight Studios for hosting us. Have a good one.